We're like two old guys, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be spending more time with you than I am with my wife. Oh. I think you have to have thick skin to be a, a designer, not even an architect. Exactly. You see all these people like little ants crawling over your building and you're like, oh no! So they understand very well. If you get that, then you get an amazing piece of architecture. Um, yeah, it's all about size. Size, size isn't everything, you know that. Mm -hmm. Tonight, our guest is a Scottish-born architect. He's a partner at Essential for Schmidt Armour Larson Architect, part of the global practice Perkins and Will. He has been practiced in Europe, North America, and for more than 10 years in China. Let's welcome Chris Hardy. Don't sleep. <laughs> Hello, Chris. <laughs> Hey buddy, how are you doing? How are you? Nice to meet you. Hey, Long thank time. you for your time for joining us. Yeah, it's a great pleasure uh, to have you here and we are really excited talking to you. So, you know, this interview will have a different phase and the first one is a new name and we call it Design Kilo and we would like to, uh, to go through your, um, your entire design uh, experience and, you know, learning from the very early stage to who you are now, Design Master. So on the Design Kilo part, First, we would like to, uh, to know more about you when you were little and what kind of kid were you at that time? Wow, I can't remember, it's so long ago. I'm getting, I'm getting old. Um, well, not many people uh, really think of me as this, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Scottish. I was, I was born in Scotland and raised in mm -hmm. basically the countryside of, of Scotland. Um, so, um, my whole childhood was basically there. So the countryside in Scotland is uh, pretty simple. You know, it's earth, mountains, sky, and uh, the buildings are pretty, are pretty. Uh, <laughs> and I, I don't quite know actually why I even wanted to, to be, be an architect, but I chose to study in my hometown. So like my university was Scott Sutherland School of Architecture in the Northeast of Scotland. Uh -huh. And I sort of, quite a technical school at the time like they were all about you know stone and timber and the detail of a downpipe and all this kind of stuff and and I quite liked that to be honest for sort of like a couple of years and then um, I remember in second year going to my to my professor at the time um, a guy called Ian Ramsey he had this huge influence on me and I basically said look this this is sort of uh, I'm, I'm done now with the technical thing I want to be like really creative so he basically applied and packed me off to IIT in Chicago um, for like for my third year. And it was like the first time I'd been out of Scotland, I think. And first time to the US. And, uh, you know, I ended up studying under um, Professor or Dr. Isla Berman, who was super theoretical. And I think she's like the dean of Virginia School of Architecture now. I completely just blew my mind completely different like theory throwing like Gilles, Gilles Deleuze and Guattari at me and sort of completely the opposite thing and um, you know that was it I was sort of hooked into sort of mm -hmm. the architecture from the technical side the craft that I learned in Scotland to suddenly this like creative theoretical side that, that I was learning in 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 US Wow. And then the very beginning, do you remember what, what pushed you to this direction? Or is that your family or background? No, or nobody in my family. Interest? Nobody in my family is a designer or architect. Um, and uh, I was maybe I was good at art. So I'm, 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 I'm OK at sketching. And then and it was kind of this traditional thing. If you if you're OK at science and maths, you know, maybe you, you should be an architect. Have a, have, you know, look at sort of these kind of creative engineering kind of things. And then there was, I guess there's this moment where I, I, I kind of realized that, you know, I could be a graphic designer and be creative that way. I could be an engineer and be sort of creative that way. But to have the privilege to work with physical space, to sort mm -hmm. of be creating something that has the potential to affect someone, their well-being and how they are, is it going to be uplifting? And I just find fascinating, you know, so, um, I gave it a go and it kind of stuck. Well, well, yeah, <laughs> still. <laughs> I mean, I could change now, but maybe it's a bit late. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was also one of our questions. It's 
if you you didn't choose this path, what do you think it could be, or maybe uh, today, or well, yeah, what, what could be your dream work or profession if it's not this one? It's a really hard one. It would it would definitely have to be something creative, probably something to do with, uh, with uh, art. I I would think. You know, like one of the one of the, the coolest things we get to do as architects is, is work with artists. And and I, mm. I mean, you're it's not landscape architect. But it's kind of like you know, I, I always envy that 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 they have or, or they have to force themselves to give them this themselves this freedom, right? You know, and you know, we have that freedom as well, but we have the the, the reality of of all the complicating things, but many times that's that's the challenge of it. But I think if I was going to do something else, I would probably simplify it down and be like some sort of art installation or sculptor or something. We can move to the to the next section about yeah what we call design padawan. It's how um, what really uh, form your value, your um, aesthetic, your sense. You have been talking already a bit about that. And here we uh, we would like to um, to know a bit your grand tour, the different city where you have been living, and uh, how uh, this city influenced you. What you discover there, you, you have been mentioning already a bit, but I'm sure you have been in more cities than that. Sure. Yeah. Well, when I was when I was in uh, I was in Chicago at IIT, I actually met uh, a British architect, Chris Wilkinson, who was over mm. as a critic, and he. He basically gave me a job straight after, and, and I, I moved to London and uh, and worked for his his office there. And that was like a started a period of time, like a decade in in London, basically, you know. And um, I sort of working for 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 Chris Wilkinson, and then and then a period of time working for David Chipperfield, and you know that was quite interesting because someone like him was was also, you know, I, I had this affinity with what the way he sort of thought, you know, he was very into uh, simplicity and, and strength of materials and this, you know, the, the form being very, very uh, clear. And then through him, I started to sort of work a little bit abroad in North America. Actually, I do a lot of libraries now, or we do a lot of libraries now. And my first library project was actually when I was at David Chipperfield's a project in Des Moines, in Iowa. and then, then after that, I worked a little bit for a local firm called Howard Tompkins, also did a, a library mm. project there. And actually, it was 2008, I met Morton Schmidt, who is the founder, one of the founding partners of, of Schmidt Hammer Lassen or SHL. And he, he said, oh, we've just won a project in Aberdeen, which is my hometown. And it was yeah. the Aberdeen University uh, of Aberdeen Library. And basically, he said, "So we're going to open a studio in in London, and we'd like you to, to to sort of like come and and run it and try and try and win more work." So so I jumped and 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 sort of started working for him, and it was a really interesting time. It was like two thousand eight, um, but there was a recession, and you know, even though I was Scottish or British, they wouldn't give any work to a Danish uh, practice in the UK. It was really hard. So we couldn't really win any work in the UK. So we decided to look, and there was this period of time where we would go around and, and look at other places. And we went to Canada and we ended up working at the Halifax Central Library in Nova Scotia, Canada. And that started this whole period of me like traveling from London to Nova Scotia, which was great for me because Nova Scotia is, is New Scotland, right? So, you know, a couple of times I would go over, I would take my kilt and then, <laughs> it, it was just an amazing experience to, to, to work on that project over there. And then round about that time, we started to get some, some calls from China. Mm. So, so about a, a couple of projects in Beijing. And, you know, so I, I'd always been sort of really hands on. Like I said, I could never, it was every, every month I would fly twice to Halifax from London because I wanted to be there. I wanted to sort of meet people. Mm. I wanted to work with the local team and, so the idea of, of doing something in China at distance whilst doing this was a bit crazy. So they had this period of about six years, six months, sorry, where I was going from London to Halifax, Halifax to London, London to Beijing, Beijing to London, wow. London to Halifax. <laughs> and, you know, all my, all my gold card travel 
they, they're all from that time, you know, like they so happy. Like I'm like whacking them on everything from like that time. And and mm. that was sort of really, really fascinating. So round about sort of once our work had been finished on Halifax Library, we were like, shall we open a, a studio in China? <clears throat> and like our thought was, well, we, let's do it, but we need to mean it. So we need to go over there and not be a typical international studio with a rep office. We're going over there. We're going to I build an office it. with a heart. We're going to do all the design there. We're mm. going to build the team. And basically, that's that's kind of what we we did. And um, our studio and where I live is in the former French concession, um, which is just the. I think one of the most amazing places to live. It's like a global village, right? It's like a, yeah, yeah. like a village, but it's in the most populated city in the world, you know? And yeah, yeah, exactly. You, know, you can walk everywhere, you can cycle. And I always say that sort of, there's three things I love about China. You know, one is like the history that's sort of there. So you have like the French concession where they started planting all those plane trees in like the end 18th, 50s and 1900s right yeah, yeah. amazing yeah, yeah. and the second thing is like the future mm. like all the technology and you know mm. my friends in the west think i'm lying when i say that i don't think i've actually touched physical money in about oh, four sure. years right yeah <laughs> and it's kind of this combination you know and then the third thing is like i always say is optimism you know like it's like history future optimism so there's this like op exactly everything is always moving forward everything is positive exactly can do right? so i think we yeah we really have a similar experience on that yeah and can you um explain a bit more how you start your uh, your studio in shanghai you know you have been yeah talking uh, very well and it's very nice and exciting to know more how you effectively built your team uh, studio with a soul and you know and the spirit etc because I'm doing the same here and uh, uh, just three years and it's taking time to to create that it's really um yeah very interesting question for me yeah yeah um well well i i, I think the it was very slow at, at, at first you know like i think for the first mm. uh, six months we were only like a couple of people but but basically we, we just wanted to, to to go out and see what was happening and find out the difference between sort of good clients uh, our good projects, bad projects, what was out there, what the opportunities mm. were, but then being real, really realistic about what we could do. And then, but of course, still leaning on our, on our studios back in Copenhagen at the time. You know, so, so we would do a lot of, uh, a lot of work. We'd, we'd go and meet sort of people and, and just get our, our, our faces out there and then just slowly build it up. And, and I mean, you know, in, in, in China, most of the work, especially if we're doing cultural work is, is through competitions. Uh, mm. although we have many direct commission projects as well but it, it gets very very competitive so we would we would enter these these competitions and, and just start going for it and you know we were mm. really lucky in, in in the first couple of years we won a, a series of of projects that just allowed us just to grow the the, the office and we won a lot of projects in Ningbo like this uh this project our Ningbo library okay. <laughs> like one of our first um first projects and we ended up doing a series of projects in, in Ningbo. Um, and then sort of in Shanghai, we sort of um, were like, like this project down here is uh, uh, the project right next to the Chinese pavilion on the old expo site. Uh, mm. So we, we, we just sort of started to do that. We, would, we had a kind of rule that we would try and um, keep our office balanced. So we wanted it kind of 50-50 male, female. We wanted it to be 50-50 international and Chinese. and and so we kind of try to curate the team like they were a new family because, mm. you know, when the office, our office is 100 people now, so it's much different from when it's sort of 10 people and 15 people. You know, we're still kind of like a family now, but it's quite hard to keep in touch with the whole family all of the time. Whereas when it's sort of small, you're living in each mm. other's pockets. And, and I used to always say, you know, when I interviewed people that I was trying to test them because... I was, I, I wanted to see how scared they were when I said, you know, I'm going to be spending more time with you than I am with my wife. And 
about the so you have been working on cultural facilities for uh, for a long time you have plenty of experience on, on that and i'm curious to know if you see um, an evolution uh, in this kind of projects through the, the year and uh, how you feel about this specific uh, equipment for a city and of course i'm in shenzhen and i'm thinking about shenzhen because you know shenzhen city without culture la 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 we have been hearing that for a very long time. So how, how you, do you think about that? It's a hard question, this one also. <laughs> no, for us, I mean, one of the reasons that we like cultural projects is because we like the idea of creating space directly for people uh, mm. and for them to, to sort of do and gather in different ways, not for a specific task. And then that's why we kind of in, 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 in the the sphere of culture, we kind of went towards libraries. And we're kind of finding now that our, our, our expertise and, 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 and interest in this is starting to infiltrate different kinds of project types. You know, so if we're doing a hospital, you know, we're mm. talking about people in the same way about their view and the proportion of the space and the material yeah. of a wall, you know, all these simple things. And then at school, you know, like how we bring the students together in one space, how we give them choice, how we give them, you know, access to different uh, spaces and, uh, and a sort of collection of different types of spaces for them to, to learn. And it all sort of comes from like the way we're, we're thinking about, about libraries. And then, you know, our biggest project uh, sort of to date is a power plant in Shenzhen, mm. which has nothing really to do with culture at all, right? But actually, you know, the reason that we, we won that project was because we treated it from the perspective of people. You know, what was this thing going to be for? Well, it was going to be burning trash and making electricity. That's fine. That's taken care of. But actually, what it should be doing is being an example and educating people. Educational, yeah. Yeah, so, so it needs to, like, attract them. Mm. It needs to not be this thing that's behind a fence. And, you know, mm. and uh, so, so why don't we combine all of that into one big grand object, which kind of looks maybe more like a cultural project than mm. power plant. You know, it's not tall at one side and low at the other. It's kind of a bit more flat and... You know, it, it, it's sort of sitting like a sort of sculpture. You know, it's mm. an object. Is it a stadium? Is it a museum? Like, what is it? Um, and this all came from, like, thinking about it from a cultural perspective. Um, mm -hmm. And then sort of the, the, the same thing is happening on some of the theatres that we're working on. You know, we're, we've been working with the, uh, the West Bund in Shanghai now since, I think, like 2011, where... Basically, the first project we ever did for them was a little pavilion to attract people. You know, nothing more. It didn't even have a. It didn't even have a use. I mean, you know, pavilion comes from the world papillon butterfly or ephemeral mm. there, and then it's gone. You know, and it ended up staying there and sort of having a series of different uh, iterations. But then from there, we've been working with Westbound on a series of projects. I see a, a lot of companies that are, yeah. You're doing design, landscape, whatever, or also um, somehow becoming curator or trying to involve more on management or, uh, um, and I'm thinking when you do museum or, you know, this kind of equipment, is that something that uh, interests you or pushing in this direction or really it's, you know, the architecture and, and stop? Um, you, you know what I mean, I, I guess, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, um... It's definitely not the architecture and stop, right? I, I'll never forget, like, one of the first buildings I, I, I ever did, you know. You work on a project for so long, you get so close to it. I mean, it's your baby, right? And then the day mm. comes where you hand it over, and then these you just see all these people, like little ants, crawling over your building, and you're like, oh, no, what's that? <laughs> and then you, you sort of, you, once, once you realize, it's like, it's, this, is, this is actually what it's about. So now it's like the day that people start to use the building is the best day, right? Because that's when you start to see mm. people's sort of reactions and, and all that kind of stuff. But for us, I mean, one of the things that we really enjoy getting involved in is kind of the artistic interventions in some of our projects, you know, where, where we try and get artists involved. So, you know, spanning all the way back to like our Royal Library in Copenhagen, you know, like a lot of our uh, cultural projects 
have this, you know, through to like our um, Aros Museum of, of Art in Aarhus in Denmark, which has your rainbow panorama, uh, which is the installation by Oliver Eliasson, you know, which, is, which was done with, with SHL and kind of like how art can integrate into it. So here, uh, yeah, we're working with, with um, a series of, of different artistic, um, I guess you could say facilitators, uh, to to bring in different artists into to certain yeah. projects. So we did a project in Beijing where um, the Australian facilitator UAP uh, brought in um, Charles Petalon, the French photographer. You know, he takes these amazing pictures of of balloons uh, sort of lit up, and then he bursts all the balloons. So all is left is the photograph, and it's really fascinating. You know, so it was like. It, we're doing this renovation for sort of IT and cloud computing. So wouldn't it be cool that he did his first permanent cloud installation in China? And it, we managed to sort of get him in with UAP to, to do something like that. And then the same is happening on, on the Shanghai Library, you know, so that we have these series of, of, of atriums which all look out to the park and look out to the city. And they will each have an artistic intervention by... Uh, either a Chinese artist uh, or a foreign artist uh, to kind mm -hmm. of make this this link um, around the, around the globe. So you know, even though we're not directly involved in the curation of of it, um, we, we we encourage it like all the time. I mean, we had some we've had some bad situations where we've tried to curate it, and I think that the the best thing it's it's a bit like us. We we don't want to be curated. We want to be in control of our creativity. And, and an mm. artist is the same, right? You know, I think that you, you might have to give them some things like, you know, regulations and lighting and, you know, but it, you want them to be completely free. Um, and then they contribute to the architecture as much as, as the architect does sometimes. Mm -hmm. And with all this here in China, which is your favorite project, the, the project for you that yeah, matters the most? Not matters the most, but you know the one that is, have a special meaning for you. Well, twenty twenty one, yeah, twenty twenty one. This year will be a, quite a big year for us because two yeah. of our biggest projects will complete at the end of this year mm. that we've been working on for the last five six years. So the first one is um, Shanghai Library East. So that will complete mm. at the end of December. 2021 and that has been an absolutely crazy journey you know it's the it's the biggest new library in china it's the biggest library we've ever built it uh it sits next to the biggest park in shanghai and um, you know it's already been visited by xi jinping you know mm. so every decision that we make on that project the process is really exhausting but mm. it has to be done to go through everything you know um and hopefully it's going to turn out to be a really spectacular space it's huge you know i think you can probably fit our black diamond project in copenhagen you can probably fit it in the atrium it's it's just insane um that was all also about like our experience of designing say libraries around the world so you know i already talked about one of my hometown in aberdeen you know we designed one in halifax in canada we did the biggest one in northern europe in aarhus called doc one uh, we did the melbourne library uh, renovation we did christchurch library and now we're doing my library and each one of these you know libraries are, are very much about reaching out to the world but also about looking back at yourself you know, citizens of the city, making them understand their place in their city in the world. So that's one thing. And then there's the idea of knowledge, people gathering to share knowledge. So the obvious uh, thing here for us was what historically, when did that happen? Well, it happened when scholars would come around a rock in a garden, a Chinese garden. And our site is in the biggest Chinese garden in the city, you know, Century Park. So let's just make a huge rock. You know, let's make this huge object that just floats above the trees. And from that point, that, 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 that was the concept. And then we just built on that within a number of moves. So actually inside, it's a lot like a Taihu stone. 
um, on the outside, it's kind of like jade. You know, we like the idea of jade being this really super rough stone and then someone crafts away at it and it becomes this beautiful piece of jewelry. So it's kind of like a person bettering themselves through knowledge and experience. And so we just pack these ideas in um, that allow us to sort of explore what we want to do in an architectural sense. Um, and then the, the next project, which of course is in Shenzhen, which is why I've been going to Shenzhen so much for the last five years, is the waste to energy power plant in, in, in sort of northeast Shenzhen in Longan. And this is also a crazy project. And in many ways, I, I, I can't actually believe that they built it. You know, I mean, it's going to finish at the end of this year. They, they, they have the facade to finish and, and the roof is, is under construction. But, you know, to, 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 to commit to something so large, you know, it's almost like the infrastructural size of an airport. And to make it and see it through with such commitment to our initial design intent um, That's nice, yeah. is amazing. You know, I mean, when, when, yeah. you finished, you, when you walk around it, it's one and a half kilometers to walk around it. And, wow. you know, 350 meters in diameter and 65 meters high. Um, it's just this all inspiring thing when you see it and it's completely hidden and you only see it when you sort of take you know take the little windy road up these amazing hills through these like densely forested areas and then suddenly you see these sort of two stacks just like sticking mm. and it suddenly appears so so those those two projects are mark a really major milestone for our studio mm. um, so it's interesting because um yeah, it's all about size. <laughs> but I understand when I ask you which one you care the most, <laughs> it's about the biggest, uh, you know. <laughs> and, size, uh, size isn't everything, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but it, actually, the first people ask us that as well, who, especially those who are not working in China. But our first project, mm -hmm. our first cultural mm -hmm. project in China was for the West Fund in Shanghai. And that was a 150 square meter pavilion, mm -hmm. the cloud pavilion. You know, it was tiny. Um, so, I mean, I, I think we've just been really lucky to get involved with like certain governments, really ambitious plans, you know, so Shanghai government's ambitious plans to cater and build a brand new central library. And then Shenzhen's plans to sort of not only deal with the challenge of one of the world's fastest growing cities. I mean, I'm older than Shenzhen. That's cr how crazy mm -hmm. Shenzhen is, right? You know, it wasn't even a city when I was born, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it, it's sort of, that, that is, is really amazing. So the scale, I guess, sort of comes with the territory a little bit. Um, I think we can enter in the last part about who you are today and more about your experience now. You tell us that you have been walking and visiting Shenzhen a lot. So what is your impression about this city? And uh, did you see uh, evolution or what, what really intrigued or fascinate you in this city? Yeah, <laughs> Shenzhen <laughs> is like a crazy city. I mean, <laughs> you've been there for like over 10 years, right? That's yeah. what you know. But the reason I love going to Shenzhen, I kind of feel like I'm going into the future. Yeah. Like I really genuinely feel, I think the last time I was there, I went the day before a, a presentation, I was staying in the hotel. I got to the hotel really late and mm -hmm. I ordered room service on my phone from a QR code in the room. Yeah. About 20 minutes later, my phone went and saying I was at the door. And I'm thinking, why would I not, why would the person not knock on the door and say room service? I go to the door, open it up and there's this little robot. You know, and he just sort of the head opened up. And there was a tray with my food, you know. Just, yeah, that's it. And away it went like, down the corridor. And I just, like, it's just Shenzhen for me. It's just so far ahead of everyone else that it's kind of, it's just in the future, right? So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, is, it is a wonderful place. I mean, I think, of course, it's helped by the amazing weather and the greenery. And what's nice to see, I think, now is the acknowledgement that this vast development of the city has sort of damaged 
the greenery mm -hmm. of the city and that the projects now are encouraging it to be brought back. I mean, you're a landscape architect in Shenzhen. You know about the challenges that, that um, you know, they have yeah. about sort of bringing back that, that lost landscape that's had to be sort of forfeited to make or allow the city to grow so fast. And then the other mm. thing I love about it is it's just so young. I mean, I'm in my yeah. 40s, but I feel like I'm the oldest guy there. <laughs> <laughs> in town. <laughs> just like me. <laughs> yeah, like, we're like two old guys, right? You know, it's, it's yeah. such a young city. It's just so full of energy that you can't sort of help but not get intoxicated by it. You know, mm. kind of, I, I feel like when I come back to Shanghai, it's kind of like, whew, you know, I can uh, I can relax now because of the pace of, of Shenzhen is just so so crazy. So uh, yeah, I would like to ask you a bit about your worst experience uh, and worst project maybe in China. It could be experience or project up to you within the last ten years maybe. Um, there's been quite a lot. I mean, I, I you know. I think you have to have uh, thick skin to, to, to sort of work. I think you have to have thick skin to be a, a designer, not even an architect. You know, mm. you sort of pour your heart and soul over something for so long and you sort of show it to someone and they don't like it. And all of that work, sometimes for months, is over like that. Yes. And the ideas with it kind of just die. So, you know, At the beginning, for me, the worst experience was always losing a competition. Not because, mm. you know, I can't handle losing, but it was kind of like the feeling of the effort that you and the team had put in and that someone didn't like it. Now, you know, we treat it as much more as a creative process. So the most important thing for us is that we believe in it and that we like it. And, of course, we're trying to bring in what the client is interested in and trying to answer the questions that they, they want. But there is always a chance that they won't like it, that they have a different way of thinking than us. So that's always a bad, bad experience. Um, and then I think the final thing, which is constantly a challenge to work you, you, here, is uh, the lack of power as an architect. So mm. architects typically are not, they don't have much power. Maybe we have some at the beginning, um, but generally none. And then in China, an international mm. architect has even less. So, you know, yeah. that is a really, really hard thing. And that becomes about relationships, relationships with our client, relationships with our collaborators, um, making sure that we're on the same page. And if you get that, then you get an amazing piece of architecture. But if you don't get that, it's really hard to get it back, right? So I understand very well. I mean, we just, uh, we took part in the competition for the Shenzhen Center for Performing Arts. Um, and we were shortlisted down to the final five, but we didn't, we didn't get it. Mm. And, um, and in a way, you know, that our proposal, of course, we look at it and, There was so much thought that went in exactly. the meaning of the city and how it could engage with the performing arts, how it could bring nature back. Exactly. You know, it's all of these things. But I think, you know, for, for, for us, it's we, we get into this mindset where, you know, we're a creative studio and mm. we're just creating all of the time. And our hope is that there's these moments in time where a client comes along and they go, yeah, we'll have that one. And we keep going, you know, yeah, we'll have this one. And we keep going. I think if you think in that mindset, you kind of stay a bit more sane <laughs> than if, you know, every time you do a project and you look at it, you, know, you, have to, you have to celebrate the creativity rather than like whether someone else liked it. It's about whether you like it mm. and whether you think mm. it's a development of your uh, your sort of agenda and your style. I think uh, yeah, it was really <laughs> great time and great, uh, great interview, great discussion. And I hope to see you very soon in Shenzhen. I know yeah, you will come in a few weeks. So yeah. <laughs> face to face, wine, wine to wine. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
Thank you. Absolutely. Good to see you, buddy. Yeah. Ciao. Thank you for your time again. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye.